Today we are looking at Psalm 5, Psalm 38, and Psalms 41 and 42. So we're only covering four Psalms today. Go check them out for yourself. They do all seem to have a common theme today. Yeah, so if we're thinking back to the stories that we've been looking over with David and his very dysfunctional family and children and all the craziness that followed, I don't know, the last several episodes that we've been recording. Poor guy. Yeah. These, Ish. yeah, I guess that too. Anyway, these Psalms uh, were very interesting because they were all lament Psalms. So these are all just like these cries out to God, whether it be um, to deliver him from some kind of persecution from someone else, uh, whether it be like asking for blessings, um, or even when we were reading 41, um, like for God to remember him when he is, um, like helping out someone else. Um, so we just, we see these lament Psalms and it's really interesting because of the context that we have been seeing David in recently. Like it is no surprise to me that he's just calling out for help often. I'm reading over. So all of these, all of these Psalms occur in the first book of Psalms. We haven't talked about this really at all, but yeah, I was kind of confused by that earlier. Psalms is written in five different books. So these are actual song books that the people of Israel would have used in worship, in procession, like in all kinds of situations. And it, it was divided into five different books. It's like an old school hymnal. Sort of. Yeah. Um, and so today, Psalm 42 uh, which is the or psalm that got my attention, or sorry, I'm sorry, Psalm 41, which is the one that got most of my attention. Uh, it is the final psalm in book one. What's interesting about the final psalms in these books is that they often end with a double amen. <laughs> so you can see uh, verse 13, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, amen and amen. Uh, that is how the first three psalm books end, amen and amen. In case anybody was confused. <laughs> there you go. So if you hit a double amen, you're at the end of one of the books. Um, the final two end with like a like a high praise of God, basically. Uh, but these are divided into sections. We don't see that anymore, but this is how they would have experienced them in the original audience. Hmm. Um, another interesting thing to me is that Psalm 1 promises blessing to the person who obeys the law of the Lord. So, um, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and it does he meditate day and night? Mm -hmm. I think that's what it says. Uh, he shall be like a tree planted by streams of water. So, like, God blesses people who obey the law. And Psalm 41 basically guarantees a uh, blessing again on people who are in trouble and call on the name of the Lord because he'll protect them and care for them. So one thing that I'm noticing across all four of these Psalms is there is, and I feel like we've talked about this before in the Psalms, there is a very clear understanding of righteousness and wickedness. And there's also a very clear understanding of when you commit wickedness, when you sin, you have to repent before the Lord and basically beg for God's forgiveness and trust that he will give it, but you need to beg for it. And so it, it's sort of interesting, and I know we've we've talked about this in the past, but the way these psalms are written, there is a very clear understanding that when you are sinning before God, you are far from God, and you need His uh, grace and His forgiveness to be brought back into right relationship with God. It's interesting how these are psalms of lament, and these do seem to correlate with what's going on in David's life at the end of Second Samuel, and. All of the events at the end of Second Samuel are tied directly to his sin. And so it's it's not odd that these laments are coming out of uh, sinful decisions in David's life. And so these these songs that have been written reflect um, kind of the, the consequences of sin and the need for forgiveness and righteousness before God. Mm -hmm. I guess my interesting, like or something that's interesting to me and like causes me to really think is like Psalm 41 is specifically talking about when you are giving of what you have or of yourself to the poor. And yet you are still in like significant suffering. Like God is going to bless you for that. Yeah. Right. Like on your sick bed is, is what it says. Right. What's interesting to me is like that seems very works-based 
And to me, I feel like it is a really hard, like, pendulum kind of feeling that I get where it's like, well, works are really good. But then it's like, well, wait, no, like, the only thing that actually matters is just faith. So I go back and forth, and it's probably, like, a both thing. But for me, it is, like, it's hard to separate, like, well, this is saying that God's going to bless you if you help the poor. But then we, like, I remember in college we had this, like, assignment where it was, like, <laughs> very much works over um, works over faith or faith over works. Like, what's more important? And I feel like this one is kind of, like, making me wrestle with that thought. We have stumbled into a pretty significant faith conversation. Um, Sorry. This, this <laughs> is... Is justification by faith alone, or do works have to be part of it? Uh, James has a lot to say about that. Paul has a lot to say about that. Martin Luther has a lot to say about that. Um, obviously, I think we believe that uh, righteousness comes through faith alone, and that's established in Genesis. Mm -hmm. Abraham was credited as righteous before God because he believed God, not because of what he did for God. But because he believed God, he did things for God. And so there's a there's a quote that I'm probably going to butcher, but it is basically like God is not opposed to works. He's opposed to earning. So hmm. God's not against you doing good things. He's against you thinking that those good things give you righteousness. You do those mm -hmm. good things because you've received righteousness. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually like a good way to put it, I think. So then in chapter 41, uh, where it talks about the person who considers the poor. Our footnotes say something interesting that the poor is usually referring to specifically the poor of Israel in the Old Testament. Um, so again, what's even more interesting to me and something that I've been thinking about, and it, it makes me feel like kind of selfish, I think. So correct me if I'm wrong and maybe I'm just like totally off. But a lot of what I feel like I've been learning and reading is like, it's like edifying the church or edifying the people over, and you can cut this out if this is wrong, over like people outside of like God, there, Christ followers. There's definitely a significant concern for God's household. There's definitely First and foremost. There's definitely a significant concern for God's family. Um, this, this Psalm 41 verse 1, uh, if you dig into it, you can look at different commentaries. Th this is interpreted several different ways. So one is for face value, poor means poor. So bl like blessed is the one who takes care of the poor. Does that mean within Israel? Most likely because this is a royal psalm for Israelites that were very isolated as a community. They were sojourners and they were commanded to be gracious to sojourners. Um, but the understanding would have been for the poor. when the When the early church was taking offerings for the poor, it was oftentimes for poor people in other churches in other countries. And so you do have... Assuming that they were, like, following God. Yeah, correct. So, like, when, when Ananias and Sapphira, they're in Acts, they sell a field, and they lie about the proceeds of that field to the apostles, mm -hmm. and God, you know, judges them on the spot. It's a case for judgment outside of the Old Testament. Um they were giving that money to the church to be used to benefit the poor people of the church. Uh, there's a, there's a case in Acts six and seven where the, the widows, the Greek widows and the Hebrew widows, they have a disagreement because the Greek widows are not being fed the right amount. And you get this picture in the early church that somebody is giving proceeds and money to this food program that is for widowed believers in the church. And so there is a significant call to care for believers. There's a significant call to edifying the body and building up the church and equipping the saints. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't help other people though. Right. And that's, but I, it's interesting to me that that has been something that I feel like I've been hearing a lot, but then also it, it like straight up says it in this, mm -hmm. in the footnotes here. That is, that's one interpretation, but it is an interpretation that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, another interpretation is actually when it says poor, it actually means like people who are struggling in their faith or are far from God. Hmm. So there, there's multiple directions you can take this. It's all rooted in the original languages and stuff. Uh, but the idea is when you care for people who have a need, I'm taking like a super broad based approach here. When you care for people who have a need, God cares for you when you have a need. 
So there is another thing in here worth uh, paying attention to a little bit, and it, it's basically in Psalm 41, it talks about when you are caring for people who are, are poor, and we've just talked a little bit about what that means specifically. Um, I think it's worth calling out verse three, the Lord sustains him on his sickbed in his illness, you restore him to full health. Um, in the Old Testament, and actually continuing into the New Testament, a lot of people's ideas were that sins led to sickness. And so sometimes you get this idea of God healing sickness, and that means that God does heal sickness, but it also means that God forgives sin to those original audiences. So these two things are tied together, and this is a lament um, that is calling out for help from God, and it's basically saying, like, God will forgive your sins and he will heal you. You can't ignore the fact that verse 3 says, the Lord sustains him on his sickbed and in his illness, you restore him to full health. So when we deal with being sick, when we deal with needing healing, the Lord does do that when the Lord chooses to do that. And oftentimes it is connected to how you've been living your life before God. I know that I know that God heals all kinds of people. This psalm is talking specifically about healing comes to those who are obedient to the Lord. And that is healing for sin and it is, I believe, physical healing as well. So that is available to us today. Um, and actually, the, the, the best way to be certain of that possibility is to live a life of righteousness before God. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, your part for today, focusing specifically again on chapter 41, uh, if we look at chapter 41, verse 12, it says, but you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Our Bible has a footnote that talks specifically about this that just says, because of the faith of this person, um, that person can be confident that God will continue to honor his integrity, specifically because of his kindness to the poor. So we were just talking how this, what seems to be um, like works or good works, ultimately has to be intertwined with faith uh, because God will acknowledge your works through faith, um, especially in those times of like hardship. Um, so I, I would even encourage us all today, uh, look for those opportunities where you can incorporate good works um, through faith, even when it seems like it's a difficult, challenging, or maybe not the most comfortable or easy situation to do so. Um, people with needs are literally everywhere you look. Um, and a simple like act of of kindness and goodness towards someone else through faith, knowing that that's what the Lord requires of us, um, is definitely a reflection of who he is and what he requires of us. So I would encourage you to look for those opportunities today because they are literally everywhere. So we'll see you back tomorrow when we are back into the story of David. Thanks so much for listening to God's Plan, Your Part. If anything stuck out to you, if you have any questions, or if you'd like to receive a Bible, you can email us at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please consider supporting us through the link in our description. We love that you're on this journey with us, and we hope you have a great day. See you tomorrow.